Hi, welcome back to the summit. In this session, I'm going to be talking with Ray Archuleta. I've gotten to know Ray over the last several years because of the work he's been doing on a very pioneering way to do agriculture. Instead of uh, tilling the crops on an annual basis and disturbing the soil, there are many farmers that are learning now how to put in a cover crop of a diverse number and types of plants, not just one kind of cover crop, but maybe five, six, ten, even ten different kinds of plants at a time that protect the soil, are living in the soil all the time, and then when they're ready to plant their crop, they knock that crop down and, and plant right into that cover crop. The cover crop is slowed down. It becomes like a mulch on the surface of the ground, keeping the soil cool, providing food for the life of the soil, and the crop that it put in comes in and, and um, shades out any of the weeds that have a tendency to want to grow up underneath the crop itself. This way, we're able to get yields on an annual basis, but at the same time, we're building topsoil. This is huge because when you build topsoil, you build organic matter in your soil. When it rains, you hold more water on the landscape, which means you minimize the risk of flooding. You minimize the challenges of drought. And on top of that, the topsoil gets thicker and thicker and thicker, which means that we literally are building, we're repairing the soils that we have deteriorated over the last hundreds of years. This is really breakthrough kind of farming, and Ray is on the cutting edge of it, meeting and working with farmers that are doing this on an annual basis. Before I interview Ray, I want to show you two short films that I found on YouTube that do, does a great job of explaining what this cover cropping is, as well as gives you an idea of how passionate and creative Ray is in his ability to communicate what this is all about. I think you're really going to love these videos. They're only, one of them is two minutes, the other one is one minute long. Please enjoy the videos, then we'll go to the interview with Ray. I remember the day that everything I understood about soils began to change. It was the day I met Ray Archuleta. It is not about the equipment. It's about the understanding. Understanding how your soil system functions. I sit through Ray's meeting at the Ag Civic Center. Ah, now we're getting to it. Oh my goodness, it's the soil biology. My first impression of Ray, I thought, boy, this man's crazy. Then he asked me and John to go with him out to North Dakota. And going out there and seeing what they have done, just, you know, I thought, there ain't no excuse that we can't use this in North Carolina. The power of diversity is extremely strong. This side is running purely off the energy of last year's cover crop. You see, I met three farmers who saw what I saw in North Dakota and they acted on it. And that started a small revolution in their home county. This is the story of their rookie years in diverse cover crops. But coming home and people, my neighbors think, they thought, that poor boy has lost his mind. He's going to lose his butt and have auction sale this next fall. There's this movement through the country where people are realizing, you know what? If we farm nature's way, we start saving an input. they got an open mind to it now instead of uh, turning their backs to it and saying, oh, he's lost his mind. And, uh, I'm just tickled to death with it. question to ask you. Is your soil healthy, functioning, and stable? One of the best visual diagnostic tools that I know of is the soil stability test. Here are two soils, exactly the same soil type. This soil has been tilled for 30 years. This soil has not been tilled for 40 years. It is covered with diverse plants year-round. Watch what happens when we drop the soil in the water. Notice how the conventional till soil is falling apart. The biotic glues in the organic matter are burned up by tillage. The soil pores have collapsed. Notice the no-till soil. The pore spaces are still intact. Do this test for yourself. I guarantee if you dig a little, You'll learn a lot.
uh, want to start kind of from the beginning, Ray, if you would be willing to talk a little bit about how long you've been working with the USDA. Uh, was it always through the NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service? Uh, what's, just tell us a little bit about your uh, experience working um, with the uh, government and agriculture. My experience started off, Bill, with um, about 15 years old. I decided that working at my uncle's ranch, I always had such a passion for agriculture. I knew that I was going to be in agriculture. So I to school, got my associate's degree, joined a couple of years, the Peace Corps, got back from Guatemala, served as a livestock specialist, got hired in NRCS in New Mexico, and I started working there from the, from the bottom and, and started working there at as a conservation technician, designing irrigation systems and livestock pipeline, doing a lot of engineering, really. And so I worked there about seven years, five years in Missouri, and then did irrigation nutrient specialist, water quality specialist, and transferred to Oregon. And there I got a, I worked there for five years as an agronomist and a district conservationist. And I think that's where my journey started there. I think I, that's where I started realizing that something was wrong with agriculture because um, you were spending millions as an agency, maybe even billions. In fact, I know billions over the 19, any of the agencies since 35, that I started noticing something was wrong. Why are farmers going broke or why can't they bring their kids into the operation and why? is the water still latent with sediment. And so started putting those pieces there and then moved to North Carolina. And North Carolina, is, I became the um, soil health specialist and worked there 10 years. And I think, like, again, in these last 10 years, that journey, of those, uh, like you were t- alluding to, Bill, I had an epiphany. My epiphany was something is absolutely horribly wrong within RCS. And it was quite sobering because you realize all the years of the first 20 years of my career was done in failure to make me aware that we're not fixing anything. Yeah. We are, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with symptoms but not dealing with the real cause of, of our agriculture issues well so um let's i tell you what let's do let's talk a little bit about what biological farming is probably one of the longest running biological farmers that i know of who is uh, showing up these days and sharing some of his work is um david brandt over in ohio uh, I believe he hasn't used a mold, mold, mold board plow since 1980 or something, uh, 35, yeah. 38 years of no plowing. Could you talk a little bit about David Brandt's operation? And, um, uh, and, and in that process, let's define a little bit about what we consider biological farming versus organic farming. Oh, great. Uh, David Brandt is one of the producers that he's been you said uh, at least uh, doing 30 years of no-till and covers, maybe even more. And what that includes is that no tillage, but using the cover crops. He's been using cover crops a lot sooner than other producers have been doing it. And the only other producer I know is Ray Styers from North Carolina. He's been doing it for 40 years. And what it is, is biological farming is... What we're trying to promote is the uh, not just a regular no-till. Because no-till is like the name no-tillage has not done well because a lot of producers use a lot of chemicals, a lot of fertilizers, a lot of uh, chemical man-made inputs. This new type of biological farming, who David is one of the forefathers of it, was using more diversity and using the power of diversity because... Uh, it not only encapsulates in the word I would call biomimicry, mimicking life, mimicking the biology, where if you look at natural ecosystems, it does not do tillage, physical tillage. What you do is inversion. What we're using is the living plants, these biological primers, energy transformers. It's this 
life of biology does the aeration in the soil. The, it, it's the one that builds the aggregates in the soil and builds the organic matter and creates these biotic glues. So the concept is you mimicking life. And so part of biomimicry is not doing tillage, physical tillage, and reducing way the fungicides, the herbicides, the, uh, anything man-made synthetic chemical fertilizer. That's what we're trying to emulate as much as possible. Okay. So then for David Brandt, um, he's, if he hasn't been using herbicides or pesticides and he hasn't been tilling the soil, how the heck has he been getting a crop? I mean, how do you get, how do you, I mean, is he raising corn? Is he raising livestock? What is he raising primarily? He, he's raising corn and soybean. Now, the, uh, don't get me wrong. In his operation, he's still using herbicide, but he's eliminated insecticides. He's eliminated fungicides. He has incredibly reduced his uh, his fertility by eighty or ninety percent, and he's still using an occasional herbicide. So it's not total free from chemical uh, chemicals. We're working towards that direction. Like Dave Brown, he has one chemical application once every three years. So when you're dealing with large scale agriculture like David, where he's doing twelve hundred acres, and Dave does four to five thousand acres. It's really difficult to get away from an occasional herbicide. And we're working towards that, and I think we're going to accomplish that with livestock, a long rotational, long rotational diversity. Those things, I think, we're going to be heading towards more a organic no-till situation. Okay. That, that, that makes sense. I appreciate you uh, clarifying that. So uh, Dave wouldn't consider himself, quote-unquote, an organic farmer in terms of the organic standards because he does use herbicide to do some short-term work but mostly it's his cover crop that's doing the work in other words a cover crop is doing 10 times more good than the amount of damage that an herbicide might be doing uh, so he is uh, is his topsoil pretty rich is it um, full of life i mean is that how he's getting his yields yes uh his i think a lot of people don't realize that it is the biology which makes all the nutrients available. So the more we pump, I call liquid sun carbon into the soil ecosystem, the more you build the microbial biomass, the more you feed these factory workers. They're the ones that make nitrogen available. They're the ones that make phosphorus available. They're the ones that make the trace minerals, the zincs and the potassiums. They go and sequester it through living roots, through our viscomycorrhizal fungus, through the uh, bacteria, all this biology. See, I think there's been a big misunderstanding. People don't understand how the soil is. is a living, dynamic ecosystem. So just the word soil denotes life. And so all that biological life is the one that makes all those nutrients available. So without a living plant and without the soil biology, you have geology. And so a lot of us walked away from agronomy and soil science school um, uh, uh, with a lot of misunderstanding how this all worked. Yes. So he's doing this, like you said, the heavy lifting is the diversity, but also I think the tillage doesn't allow the disruption of the factory or the house. And I think that's why I, a lot of organic people get confused that they think tillage is okay, but tillage is actually very destructive and very intrusive. Right. And what kind of yields is David getting then? Is he uh, up there with uh, the rest of the farmers in his county in terms of his yields, corn and soy? Oh, yes, yes, yes. His yields are just as good as the conventional. Just as good, but the, his cost are way less than the conventional farmer. Okay, because he doesn't have the herbicide, the pesticide, and he's not all the tilling, he doesn't have all the cultivating, that kind of thing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You, I have producers in Missouri that are it's costing eighty dollars an acre just for the tillage practices, and so Dave doesn't have that. Wow! The reduced fertility. Uh, No-till uses sixty-six percent less fuel than a conventional system does. Okay. Well, so then I, I heard rumors. I uh, I wanted to make it out to David's farm at some point. He had an open house last fall or this spring, and and um, actually I was going to go, but it was full. 
uh, there was <laughs> there was no room left uh, for uh, more people. He had up almost three hundred people there. I think you were there too, Ray. Uh-huh. And um, but I've heard say that his farm sits about a foot higher than everybody else's farm around him. Can you explain what that means? Well, he's got about um, we had about three hundred and fifty people show up, and what that means is that also what you're talking about a foot higher. Uh, soil is because of his organic matter. He's got more pore space. In the soil, and so the more pore space, the the higher the height of the soil is going to be. His, for example, a one percent organic matter soil will hold anywhere from seventeen to twenty five thousand more gallons per acre. Mm-hmm. And it, and it's because organic matter has the ability to hold it, but it also creates more pore space, and it's these. And I think people misunderstand about organic matter. Organic matter is not this just dark little material on top of the surface. It's a pasting of these biotic glues created by the secretions and the excretions of biology and the death of biology. Recent studies show that 40% of organic matter is dead carcasses of bacteria. Wow. So it's a fusion of life. It's a life and death interfacing right there. Some people that looked at the soil it's like this giant ruminant where it digests and and creates these incredible substances that keep those pores open. So I don't know if it's that much higher than others, but it, it also too it would it would lend to the fact that there's no erosion coming out of this place. So that could be a factor also. He's not losing soil where most farms are losing five to ten tons a year still yeah through erosion that's an amazing number we've looked at those numbers before it's like one and a half billion tons of topsoil leaves our country every year it's actually they consider it our largest export uh more you know we ship we lose more soil uh through wind and rain erosion water erosion uh than we actually ship corn or soy or anything else uh, out of this country and now that's because of this practice of tilling the soil. You're you're disrupting the soil particles. You're exposing it to wind and rain. And uh, some years it's not so bad, but other years it's you hit it just right. You've just tilled the soil, and you know no rain, and here comes the wind, and, and away it goes. So, um, uh, it, and so you know, I'll tell you what, Bill, that we're losing anywhere up to fifty tons in Iowa currently shows that we're losing still up to 50 tons of, of soil in certain parts of the Midwest. So I think our numbers are off and um, nobody wants to talk about them, but that's the reality. Right. Need more soil. And I, I think you're, you're correct. I think we, uh, we're still through our practices. We're losing huge amounts of soil. Yeah. Then I understand then uh, Gabe Brown and his son, Paul now is working with him very closely but didn't Gabe take over the family farm? Was it his farm or was it his his uh, his wife's farm? His wife's farm. Was okay. His wife's farm. So then they took over the family farm, and um, I think it was because of Dave Brandt. He was inspired. The first thing he did was gave up all of his tilling equipment, and all he had is as as a no till drill. Oh, you talk about Gabe. Gabe, yeah. Well, Gabe, his it was one of his friends. I told him, well, Gabe almost went broke and almost lost the ranch. And he, his friend told him, sell all your tillage equipment or you'll go back to it. And he did. And that's how he started. He first started off with no-till. Then it went to multi-species cover crops, mimicking the prairie type. And then also integrating animals. All of those three convergence of those type of systems and approach has absolutely put Gabe soils in a level that very few have. Yeah, that's what I understand. And his yields are excellent. So, I mean, let's talk about this. I mean, take a look at Gabe, take a look at Dave Brandt. From the standpoint of your quote unquote typical uh, uh, farmer, you know, U.S. farmer. Um, my understanding is these guys are making a really good living. 
compared to a lot of their neighbors who are doing conventional agriculture. And, you know, if it wasn't for their government check, they would be upside down. Is that accurate? Yes, that's very accurate, Bill. Um, Gabe is not only raises meat chickens, he does layers, he does his cattle, he does tours, he does public speaking, he does, um, there's, he's got trees, he's doing the permaculture on his, on his ranch where he's raising type of, uh, fruit trees. And Gabe is a, doing exactly what the natural ecosystem does, is it uses very, it, nature never puts all her eggs in one basket. It, it's very adaptive and it has uh, various streams of energy flowing through it. So same thing with, with Gabe. That's what makes him so ecologically um, resilient and economically resilient is you don't focus just on corn and soybean. And a lot of producers are just on corn and soybean, and which makes them incredibly uh, uh, non-resilient. And, and that's just a fact. The majority of producers focus on just the one or two streams of income. Yeah, that, that makes, makes it very difficult. Yeah, and they make and Gabe and they do very very well. Plus, they also sell cover crop seed. So it's it's multifaceted operation. You know what's funny, Ray, is in the uh, permaculture world. Um, you know, permaculture is relatively young. I mean, it's thirty, forty years old. We've been experimenting with these biomimicry. I mean, it's exactly everything you're talking about. But um, I think it's hilarious that Gabe Brown is one of the best permaculturist I've ever met. And he's never taken a permaculture course. When I talked to uh, him last time, he said, well, you need to tell me a little bit more about what this permaculture is. <laughs> yeah. And of course, he's, he's like one of the best permaculture designers I've ever met when it comes to developing a permaculture design for your farm. So uh, anyway, yes, it's... Yes, because it's, it's, I, read, I read Bill Molson's book years ago, and uh, he intuitively once you like you said bill that's why i love we both were such big fans of permaculture is because permaculture i would have to say one word for permaculture is mimic life mimic biomimicry and uh, follow the patterns it has set and so gabe came to that conclusion through years of uh in the in the genesis of his failure like the rest of us uh, all of us came to the same conclusion so how are we going to transition huge amounts of tract of commercial industrialized agriculture into this journey? It's going to take years, but I think we found kind of a bridge where you can take right now permaculture is for the most part on small tracts of land, maybe an acre or two acres, like you're working on 25 acres. Uh, I want to see whether we're doing thousands of acres of transition into more fruit trees into fruit trees, nut trees growing in between cropland and grazing land. Like there's an incredible place in Argentina who this guy has thousands of acres where you can see all this tapestry of integration. So that's what our goal is. Yes, yes. Well, then let's tell you what, Ray, let's just let's t touch on one more subject here, uh, because a lot of one of the things that many people see or get when they um, are plugged into our cultural media uh, is they they were going they're going to hear this message that the only way to feed the world and the world's populations, especially with the advent of um, the predictability of, of serious climate change, the only way we're going to do this is through genetically modified engineering and more industrial agriculture, bigger and better agri industrial ag. Is that even remotely true? I would argue it's absolutely false. I would say it's causing more starvation. It's causing more issues, and it's causing the people to lose their dignity. I'm an ex-Peace Corps volunteer. I served two years in Guatemala, and there's nothing more, Bill, that gets me so angry and frustrated when a politician or somebody from industrial ag stands up and says, we got to feed the world. I hate that because what it does to the current producer, agriculturist, it puts more person, uh, pressure and burn on him that should be put on him. What we have to do is teach the world how to feed themselves, how to teach them how to do biomimicry, permaculture, uh, regenerative agriculture, whatever you want to call it. Teach the people. 
we can restore the land very quickly. That we got to teach the people. The current model is an absolute failure. It requires too much energy. To, it's, it's too destructive. It's too intrusive. That's not the solution. The solution is teaching, educating, and let the other let these people in third world countries teach themselves and give them dignity so they can support themselves. Nobody wants really. If you're a person of integrity, you want you want to do it yourself. You don't want to be dependent on anybody. So I, I, I really dislike that message. It is, it is very condescending. It is very, uh, I think it, it gives you false hope, and, and, it, and I think it enslaves the producer in their own dignity. I mean, it gives them a false sense of dignity, but they don't realize that they are part of the problem. We are growing too much corn and soybean. That's yep. why the prices are so deflated. It's a, it's a failure of the whole system. Yeah. So I totally disagree with that. And I think that do we need uh, everybody growing food as much people? Absolutely. If you want to go to see a good example, look what happened to Cuba in the early 90s. Cuba, um, uh, because of the thing with Russia and the embargo and everything, these people almost starved to death. And they're a great example of how they all, about 80% of Cuba went organic. There was no food in the shelves. There was no energy. They, they bought more fertilizer per acre than the Americans did at that time when this whole disaster happened. And the Cuban people almost starved. Mm -hmm. But that whole island completely transformed into more of an organic system. Now the people are healthier. They're growing their own rabbits and own food and organically grown. They're healthier. They're better, they're, they're better fed. Uh, there's more community going. I am excited because I think where we're heading is for the same design, more community, more local markets. People are more interfaced with their food and the land. Well, right now what we have is an incredible disconnectness of the people from the land, from their food, and from the creation. And I think that's going to change. Well said, Ray. That's exactly it. I mean, it, it really comes down to what are we doing in our own backyards? One of the concepts in permaculture is you want to hold water and fertility on the landscape where it originates, where it falls. And um, and that's how we're going to rebuild this. And when you have a farm like Gabe Brown's that sits a foot taller than everybody else's farm and he's not losing topsoil, it's pretty easy to see that system can go on. That system can feed people. But uh, when the topsoil is gone and it's not holding water, uh, there's no way to grow really good crops uh, on that land. So... Um, yeah. You're right, Bill. And I think, let me tell you, I, I will tell you this challenge that we've had, especially this year with cover crops. And it has been a challenge. I think one of the things that we're going to need is an army of young people and agriculturists who are ecologically focused. And because, let me tell you, farming is not easy. Ranching is not easy. And the transitions are going to be painful. Mm -hmm. It's going to be painful because you have to take risk. You have to be well read. You have to change completely. The most most difficult thing in the planet to change is what between what's between the years. Hmm. The human mind. Yeah. This is why we have failed miserably. We've been trying to get it with money. We've been trying to throw science at it. Those are not going to fix it. The, it, the only way we're going to fix it is the transformation of the human heart and mind. Understanding that it's. It, it looks at the system wrong. It, it has to realize that it's part of the system. There has to be an appreciation and a love for the land, a rekindling for it. And until that occurs, we're not going to fix our issues. Our issues are cultural, social, psychological, and even the fact spiritual in nature. All these together. That's why my one of the top principles I teach, the principles of soul health, is... You've got to understand your social, your cultural, your uh, your psychological, and your spiritual context, and ecological context, 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 context. Mm -hmm. It is our pernicious human nature to be very greedy and want something for nothing, and yet have no love and respect for the land. That's our biggest thing. Yeah. And the second one I use is called, you cannot build ecological integrity without human integrity. 
It's yeah. not going to happen. We will not follow the principles of soil health. We will not apply uh, the principles of biomimicry or uh, permaculture unless you have integrity. Right. Integrity to study, to be committed, not to give up, and to withstand the mockery of the neighbors. Mm-hmm. Because you're going to get a lot of mockery. And you're going to get a lot of pressure. You're going to get a lot of social pressure. So I had to add that, Bill, because I think we, we miss it. I th- they, we think sometimes it's going to be pure science. Well, no, we've had, since the 30s, pure science, and it's failed miserably. Yeah. Where's the heart in all of this? The reason to do it. It's like we need to be exactly. designing for the seventh generation, not for what can you get out your generation. What can you leave behind so the next seven generations can proffer, profit or prosper? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so we, I've been, that's why with one of my slides in my class, I'll show this here. And I'll say, look, look at all the, look at all the college degrees. Look at all the conservation programs that we have. Do you see them blowing? And they just, it aggravates people. Yeah. You get people very agitated with me. I'm not trying to agi- uh, to get them aggravated with me. I'm trying to give them a sense of reality. This is not working. It's, I see we have to look inward. <laughs> like I, I, yeah, because I tell, I tell people 99.9% of my problems is me. Yeah. In the mirror. That's Third beautiful. Problem. <laughs> Ray, so, that's beautiful. So you know, ultimately, that's what it comes down to in our permaculture courses as well. I mean, as I get near the end of the course, and, and I hint to it all the way through, but uh, when we get near the end of the course, it all comes down to, you know, it's you and me, and who are we in relationship to how are we going to leave this planet when we're gone? Do we, do we care for it while we're here? Do we care for it while we are here? Do we love it? And do we leave something for the future generations? Or are we just blindly consuming it? Do we just sit there and just suck it all in? So it's uh, it really does come down right. to the heart. So You're right, Bill. Let me tell you one thing that's really <laughs> interesting to me. If somebody was telling me, I think one of my uh, pastor that was the doctor, um, Timothy Keller was probably one of the most influential uh, pastors that's really impacted me. You know, he, he's been talking about merging ecology and theology together because uh, the churches have failed miserably in how they have brought stewardship. In fact, one of the uh, great books I recommend for our reader, anybody, is by Joe Selton, just recent book called The Marvelous Pigness of Pigs. Mm. It is absolutely amazing. It's What Joe Selton does is he, he challenges the church. And I think Gabe's read the book four times. I'm on my second reading. And it, it's, it's something that I've been feeling personally like, okay, if I profess Christianity... Well, how come those who do not profess Christianity do such a better job of taking care of of God's creation? And what Joel does in that whole book, he challenges the church. He says, you know, we were given responsibility for stewardship, and yet you're doing a very miserable job not only teaching it in the pulpit, but not teaching it to the the general public. And so he's challenging them and so at Joe's book came at a very, very right time where we're challenging the uh, very conservative uh, parts of our demographics, and we need to do a better job. Beautiful. Well, let's leave it at that, Ray. Thank you so much for taking the time this morning. I'm glad we finally could connect this way, and I look forward to running into you a whole bunch more in the future. Well, thank you, Bill, for what you do and, and teaching young minds and and the transformation that is occurring, uh, I know that together we'll we'll work partnerships that we can continue building these bridges to uh, restore God's creation. So thank you, Bill, for spending some time with me today. Yeah, I'm giving you an amen for that, brother. Amen. Thank you, bro. <laughs> and we'll, we'll uh, Bill, I'm really excited about what you're doing. So Great, great Ray.